program and sorts of information and media outside of Netflix, Spotify, uh, the MPA, the RIA, the IFPI, Netflix, I already said Netflix, and other such major media outlets. And as usual, I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a streaming broadcast on Facebook, but it's also available on Mega uh, in MP3 form, in YouTube in video form. And if you have another place for me to put these shows, please get in touch. I would eventually like to have more, i.e. Twitch would be nice if I had another set of hands to help with. Uh, that would be great. But uh, in any case, those of you who have been listening to the past couple of shows may have noticed that there was something missing in the last show. That What was missing was music. Uh, there was a little bit of trouble coordinating with the guest in the last show, uh, Sassboy. There was some time zone issues and and we started a little bit late, and so I kind of kept things a little bit short. And as a cost of that, there was no music during the last show. So this show, I've got a whole bunch of music and related things lined up for you to listen to and enjoy. Hopefully the sound comes through okay on Facebook. This show in particular is probably going to be better uh, listened to after the fact. However, without too much further ado, I'll start cutting into these things. But I, I just want to point out that for most of what I'm going to play, outside of the next clip, the media is going to be free media. So you can do whatever you would like to do with it as long as you kind of give credit and don't try to claim it as your own, that sort of thing. So the I think just looking at this here, we've got some Creative Commons media, some GPL media, some by artists we've heard before, and a couple of new people. Uh, but the, the next clip is, is not a, a, a song. It is a rant. And so just as a reminder from the very first video, what exactly this show has been about, it is a continuation of the Flame of Rant Radio and this, this place where people can at least have a voice. And one of the people who has had a voice on Rant Radio is To the Ranting Griffin. So this is one of his tracks. I don't know, actually, uh, if I'm supposed to be able to play this so Two, if you're listening, uh, get in touch, because I would love to promote more of your more recent things. This track specifically is comes from like a decade, maybe two decades ago almost. So it's it's definitely up there. But I think it's still relevant today. So th this is an example of what you would hear on Rant Radio way back in the day, and which we could probably hear more of going forward. Let's give it a play. So I woke up the other day in the fucking morning. I hate mornings. There's nothing about mornings that doesn't make my dick limp. There's fucking birds singing, fucking people going to work, and a big bright fucking ball of plasma in the sky, and they're all saying, welcome to another miserable day, fuck you. So I turn on the TV, like this is going to make things better, you know? I, my dick is limp, the sun is shining in my eyes, I feel like a leopard's ass smells, and so, yeah, a good daily dose of broadcast morning television is going to pick me right the fuck up. So I turn it on, and it's good morning America. Good morning, America. And we'll have more on that later. Back to you, Diane. And here's some dumb fuck with the weather in your neighborhood. And it's formula news. It's more formula fucking news. So it probably isn't even fucking real. So I'm watching this bullshit, and now here's Charlie. And I don't remember his last name. Charlie Fucktard, whatever. And he's interviewing these three punk-looking motherfuckers, and they're going, yeah, we're suing several large movie theater companies because we don't think they should play commercials in front of the movie. We paid for the ticket, and we're not there to buy any damn commercials. And I was like, fuck yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. These are my fucking people right here. These are the people I want to drag to a secret hidden city near the core of the earth and repopulate my species with. On national TV, pissed off because they're tired of being fed mass brainwashing propaganda bullshit from giant corporations. Holy screaming mother of fuck yes. And my dick was getting hard now. I was getting a boner over this shit. Fuck you singing birds and you motherfuckers honking your horns and that giant bright ball of bright shit in the sky. You see this? I've got a hard on. You bastards aren't keeping my dick down, and I'm gonna slap this bitch until I blow a giant water cum in my fucking eye. I'm gonna slap it until I blow a wadden Ted Turner's fucking eye. I'm gonna be one happy dick slapping fuck this morning because there are other pissed off people in the world. But then Charlie Fucktard here, he fucking smirks at him like he's some kind of real television personality or something, and he says, well, don't you think it's a little whiny to be suing over this? I mean, it's just three minutes of your 
your lives. And I was like, what? Are you, are you fucking kidding me? When did your brain fucking die? You got too much fiber in the shit canals of your mind, buddy. It's just three minutes. It's just fucking three fucking minutes of your fucking life. But let me tell you something, Charlie, whoever the fuck you are. When I get sick of watching commercials on your show, I'm going to turn off the TV. And I'm going to get a phone call, and it's going to be a fucking commercial. And then I'm going to get in my car, turn on the radio, and there's going to be fucking commercials. And then I'm going to drive down the streets, and there's going to be billboards with fucking commercials. And I'm going to walk in the theater lobby filled with fucking commercials, and I'm going to go sit down and wait for the movie watching slides of fucking commercials. And then when the movie comes on, there's going to be more fucking commercials. So you know what, Charlie from Good Morning America? Fuck you, okay? Fuck your mother. Because it's not just three minutes of my life, it's another fucking three minutes of my life. Another three minutes added to the other 20 hours per day I have to spend with some corporation's dick up my ass. Another three minutes of my fucking life I could have been jerking off or saving a wheel or driving to your house in the suburbs and feeding you your fucking teeth. So shut the fuck up. Three minutes of my fucking life. Our whole lives are commercials. We're fucking commercials. We're commercials for Subaru driving down the fucking street. We're commercials for the Gap walking in the park. We're commercials for who does our fucking hair. Commercials for the Zip Cream we use. Commercials for Viagra while we're raping barefoot redheaded stepchildren. We're all giant walking billboards for Intel, Maybelline, AOL Time Warner, and fucking Walmart. We're all commercials. This whole planet is one giant fucking commercial. The only time we're not being fucked up the ass with advertisements is when we're asleep. And what's gonna happen when they figure out a way to make us dream commercials, huh? What then? Because it will happen. Mark my fucking words. One day some washed up fuck nugget like Chuck Norris will be selling us Thigh Masters in our fucking sleep. And you know, I I'm gonna be breaking some shit when that happens. I'm dreaming of a good griffin ass stuffing and Trojan man steps out from behind a tree and I'm gonna wake up and start throwing grenades at random motherfuckers. So you can take your three minutes, Charlie, and you can stuff them up your overpaid white ass because I'm sick of it. And I'm not the only one either. Fuck your dude you're getting a Dell and your eyes soaked in at Palm Olive and your Pepsi choice of a new generation because I'm the choice of a new generation, okay? Me. I am your fucking enemy because I'm not telling people to drink my fucking beer and wear my fucking clothes and smear my hemorrhoid cream up their asses. I'm telling people to think for themselves. I'm telling people they don't have to spread their legs and have your products rammed up their asses. I'm telling people to take that money and buy drugs, strap-ons, and napalm so we can burn it all down and then have drugged up godless anal sex in the ash and glow of your fallen fucking empire. And we'll do it too. I'm going to be the one to take you down. Me and other pissed off people like me are going to be the ones to finally spit in your eye and kick you in a fucking hole and forget about you. So you better assassinate me, okay? You better put a gun to my head and pull the fucking trigger, because I'd rather die than live on a planet where my very fucking life is invented by money-grubbing industry gods and handed down to me three minutes at a fucking time. This is to the ranting griffin, and obey your thirst. Drink a big bucket of shit.
So maybe I lied. That last one was definitely copyrighted. But it's kind of in the spirit of the internet to s try to rickroll people, as you guys have all been rickrolled. So in any case, ignore that one. Hopefully I'll uh, cut that one out before it gets to the copyright censors. In any case, there have been a couple of things that have been going on this week that I do want to kind of touch on. The first is when did this actually occur? 26th. So this is a couple of days ago now. This is in news from Australia that great and happy place where they have laws restricting doctors from being able to talk about 
the rate of children in their concentration camps. You've got their firewall, the Great Firewall of Australia, that blocks access to all kinds of adult material, as well as things that are only sort of quasi-questionable, like I, I don't know the, the full list of what's blocked, and I don't think anyone does. That sort of thing is not published very widely. So there's all kinds of things that you just can't get access to in Australia over the Internet, at least over the plain Internet. You'll probably still get access to it if you use something like Tor. And as far as I know, Tor still works in Australia. But there is an infrastructure in place, similar to the infrastructure that Bell and Unifor are talking about implementing here. And so let's see what have they blocked now. Quote from The Hill. Australia to block extremist content online. Quote, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison on Monday announced plans to block websites that spread extremist content during crises. The shocking events that took place in Christchurch, uh, pause. So remember a couple of videos back, we talked about the Christchurch call and how it gave lip service to the idea of human rights and our ability to express things we want and our ideas. And yet there was this sort of implicit threat within it that what it would be used for eventually would be the crackdown of opinions and speech that the government doesn't approve of. This may be the first such example of it. But important to note, this is an agreement that Canada signed. So this isn't just Australia news. If they're using the Christ Church call to justify it, this is going to be Canada news next. Anyway, continuing on demonstrated how digital platforms and websites can be exploited to host extreme, violent, and terrorist content. Morrison said Sunday, while well, in Barrett's France for the Group of Seven, or G7 Economic Summit. That type of abhorrent material has no place in Australia, and we are doing everything we can to deny terrorists the opportunity to glorify their crimes, including taking action locally and globally. Morrison linked the measures to the shootings that killed 51 worshippers at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, earlier this year. The suspected shooter live-streamed the killings and posted a hateful and racist screed online messaging boards after the attack. Australia's e-safety commissioner, now there's a title, e-safety, ooh, I want to get that commission. Somebody appoint me to that position, I will be the e-safety commissioner for Canada. Just, just give me that position, I would love it. Anyway, continuing on. We'll now have the authority to quickly shut down domains hosting terrorist or extreme violent material. Quote, continuing on. The government is also creating a protocol which will include a 24-7 crisis coordination center to monitor and notify relevant government agencies of online crisis events. On Monday, Morse announced a new partnership with the OECD to improve tech company transparency and to stop terrorist activity online. Uh, notice, this is happening through the tech company. So this will be like Facebook and Google and Amazon. Those are the places where they're going to, A, define what terrorism is, and B, just cut your domain if they feel you're in any way engaging in it, uh, continuing on. The work will establish standards and provide clarity of, about how online platforms will, are protecting their users and help deliver commitments under the Christchurch call to Im implement regular or transparent public reporting in a way that is measurable and supported by clear methodology. Okay, that, that part's not so bad. Continuing on. 17 nations have signed the so-called Christchurch call, pause, including Canada, on pause, a non-binding pledge, non-binding. Notice that it's non-binding, and yet they're already acting on it. it. Isn't that interesting? Quote, to crack down on extremist or violent content online, top tech companies, including Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, has signed on to the agreement. The Trump administration has cited concerns about free speech and has not joined the agreement. Okay, so, long story short, what is extremist content? Does that include, for example, PETA, the pe People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals? Does that, I mean, you'd have to be pretty extreme to stand naked in a street and, and have all, if you're a beautiful woman, and just have a whole bunch of men gawk at you for the animals. Or maybe extremist content is anti-abortion content. There are certainly anti-abortion people that are pretty extreme and who feel that life begins at, I don't know, conception or something. I would put that as not necessarily you know, indefensible an argument, but certainly extreme. And I don't think that they would even argue with that, right? There's all kinds of different kinds of political beliefs that you can have that are quote-unquote extreme. And yet this is what they're talking about getting rid of. It's this, this whole range of marginal belief and belief on the tails of political opinion that are nonetheless not terrorism, not harmful to anyone, just extreme, uncommon, extreme, 
on the, the, the verges of being unacceptable, but still perhaps, or perhaps within the realm of acceptable opinion. This is a democratic country, or somewhat of a democratic country, restricting what people can publish, restricting what people can read, on the basis that it finds it extreme, is the material of the, oh, let's say, the original writings of the American revolutionaries, were they extreme? I bet if you ask the British back then, they probably would say yes. There's always people that are going to be labeled as extremists. And not the ability to, of the government to just remove them and their domains from the internet, or at least from being seen by the vast majority of people who don't use Tor, that is going to be, it, that is a dangerous step. And it is a step that we shouldn't take, certainly here in Canada, but that there is going to be a call for it here. I, there has already been a call for it, that is the Christchurch call. So this is an, a, 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 going to give flavor for what we can expect here. So that is what's going on in Australia. Uh, that links to the Prime Minister of Australia. They have a timeline. I mean, yes, there's the matter of a little bit more bureaucracy in this sort of monitoring center, which, by the way, is probably going to be hooked into or in some way, shape, or form related to the terrorist fusion centers that already exist. But ignoring that part, because really, I don't really care of what, how the bureaucracy in Australia is structured. What is important to me is the ability of Australians to read and have access to information that I myself might write or other people who I might agree or disagree with, but who should be read, who should have their documents read. For example, here's another one, the Unabomber. The Unabomber committed an act of violence. He committed, he did, I, I can't remember how many people he killed, but he certainly mailed bombs to people with the intent of killing people. And yet his manifesto was printed in the New York Times at the time. Now, will the New York Times be censored for hosting in their archives a work of a terrorist, a, a work of political philosophy that, amidst all kinds of ranting and ra rambling, actually makes some really good points about how technology develops in the society that we live in? and that has been commented on by all sorts of people from all over the political spectrum, is actually making some decent uh, points. Is that the sort of thing that will no longer be able to host on a website, even though the New York Times hosts it? Or is it different when they do it? Is there something about being a the official source of truth for the, the status quo that makes them somehow immune to having their website removed? And is it only going to be the independent media the media that questions the authority of the government that is going to have our web presence threatened by this kind of law? That is the question. And especially since they, there's going to be a credibility crisis where we're, it's not going to be as clear who is the authoritative media when you can just fake the media, never mind being your own media and having your own voice, if you can start to appropriate the appearances and the sounds of the mainstream media. That's what the next story is about. So this is from uh, Jordan Peterson in the National Post, which, again, Jordan Peterson has already, or has already uh, called for censorship of some of the people he disagrees with, despite all claims aside that he supports free speech. But this one really takes the cake. So continuing on. The deep fake artist must be stopped before we no longer know what's real. Let's see what he has to say about this. I can tell you from personal experience how disturbing it is to discover a website devoted to making fake audio clips of you for comic or malevolent purposes. Something very strange and disturbing happened to me recently. If it was relevant to me, it wouldn't be that important, except perhaps to me, and I wouldn't be writing this column. But it's something that is likely more important and more ominous than we can even imagine. There are already some fraudulent schemes being perpetrated by both telephone and internet. One is known as the grandparent scam. It is particularly reprehensible because it is perpetrated on elderly people who are, in general, more susceptible to tech-savvy criminals, and second, because it is based on the manipulation of familial love, trust, and compassion. The criminal running the grandparent scam calls or emails the victim, pretending to represent a grandchild who is now in trouble with the law or who needs money for a hospital bill for an injury that can't be discussed, say, with parents, because of the moral trouble that it might ensue. They, call, they generally, generally call late at night, say 4 in the morning, because that adds to the confusion. The preferred mechanism of money movement is wire transfer, and that's a warning. Don't transfer money by wire or without knowing for certain who is receiving it, because once it's gone, it's not coming back. Pause. This also applies to Bitcoin. Don't just send Bitcoin to random strangers. Unless you really want to give money to random strangers, 
just be wary of that. Continuing on, now what, is, what if it was possible to conduct such a scam using the actual voice of the hypothetical victim? Worse, what if it was possible to do so with the voice and video image indistinguishable from the real thing? If we're not at that point now, and we probably are, we will be within months. In April of this year, a company called Coding Elite exposed an artificial intelligence AI program that took a substantial sample of my voice, which is easily accessible on the YouTube lectures and podcasts that I have posted over the last years. In consequence, they are able to duplicate my manner of speaking with exceptional precision, starting out by producing versions of me rapping to Eminem songs such as Lose Yourself, which has now garnered 250,000 views, Rap God, which has only garnered 17,000, as well as Rock Lobster. Rock Lobster? I may have to listen to this one. 1,400 views. They've done something similar with Bernie Sanders singing Dancing Queen, Donald Trump singing Sweet Dreams, and Ben Shapiro, who also delivered Rap God. The company has a model, the address of which you can find on their YouTube channel, which allows the user to make Trump, Obama, Clinton, or Sanders say anything whatsoever. It's hard to imagine a technology with more power to disrupt. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe for an old fag like Peterson, but I can definitely imagine technology that has more power to disrupt than that. But anyway, continuing. I happen to think Rap God is an amazing piece of work, and when I encountered my verbal avatar, Belting out the lyrics, I thought it was cool, in a teenage tech geek sort of way. And I suppose it was. This caused quite a stir on the net in April, with media companies such as Forbes and Motherboard noting that the machine learning technology only required six hours of original audio that is actually generated by me to produce its credible fakes, matching rhythm, stress, sound, and prose and intonation. Recently, however, a company called NotJordanPeterson.com put an AI engine online that allows anyone to type anything and have it reproduced in my voice. It is hard to get access or to use the site at the moment, presumably because it is currently attracting more traffic than its servers can handle. A variety of sites that pass themselves off as news portals and sometimes are have either been re reported or have either reported this story straight, a Sputnik news, or had a field day, his motto. Now, I don't know what it says about our current society that we're <laughs> even <laughs> like a Sputnik news is doing the right thing here, or b Gizmodo. I seem to remember, I, I went to The Onion this week, and The Onion showed a couple of news sites that it must be in the same network of news sources with. And I could have sworn one of them was Gizmodo. I might actually just check that now. Let's see. Yeah, see, look at this. I don't know if you can see this, but Gizmodo, right up there. So, so this, like, if I go to Gizmodo, is it going to also, yeah, look at this. It, it links to The Onion. It's like, this news source is totally credible. Because we know it's credible, because it is <laughs> uh, the the other news sources that are also credible that it links to includes the Onion. So yeah, Gizmodo is totally a legitimate source of news, right? Uh, totally and 100 percent. Like Sputnik is, I mean, you'll, it, that's like the Reader's Digest of Russia, right? Like they, I, I could have sworn I've seen a UFO story or two presented as a fact on Sputnik. They're they're not. As far as Russia-based media goes, uh, they're they're really not that high. And so, the, why are we using these two? Like, is there nothing else left anymore other than like fake news slash onion slash Gizmodo or Sputnik, which is probably bullshit? Anyway, continuing on, having uh, me read, for example, the Scum Manifesto, hypothetically an acronym for the Society of Cutting Up Men. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that, that's a good one. Okay, continuing on. A radical feminist rant by Valerie Solanus, published in 1967. Solanus, by the way, her later shot the artist Andy Warhol, an act driven by her developing paranoia. I don't think, it, was it really paranoia? Really, I mean, like, I, I haven't read that particular manifesto, which, by the way, would be hard uh, to read, hard to get access to if Canada implements the kind of ex blocking of extremist content it's not going to, of course, keep the radical feminists from having access to it. They'll obviously have paper copies or some alternative channel to get it. it, it but is, is it really an act of paranoia? Anyway, someone who's read this, please tell me. Like, is it, is it paranoid, or is it just a logically consistent, hateful work? Because there is a way to, to be. If you really, really don't like the patriarchy that much, I, th I think it's totally consistent to to go to the lengths of a manifesto like that. Now, I'm not going to advocate that what they did is right, but I think that the, it's, it's not mere paranoia 
to and irrationality to to hold the, those beliefs. Anyway, continuing on. He was seriously wounded, re requiring a surgical corset to hold his organs in place for the rest of his life. TNW takes a middle path, reporting the facts of the situation with little bias, but using the system to have me voice very vulgar phrases. So, yeah, this, this is uh, kind of how we're covering this. Bizarre. Anyway, continuing on. Some of you might know, and those of you who don't should, that similar technology has also been developed for video. This was reported, for example, by the BBC's back as July 2017, when it broadcasts a speech delivered by an AI Obama that was essentially indistinguishable from the real thing. Similar technology has been used, equally notoriously, to superimpose faces of famous actresses on porn stars while they perform very sexual exploits. Movies have also been reshot so that the main actor is transformed from someone unknown to someone with real box office draw. This has happened, for example, to Nicolas Cage, primarily on a YouTube site known as Deep Derp Fakes, a play on Deep Fakes, which is what the video recordings created fraudulently by AI have come to be known. More recently, Control Shift Face, a YouTube channel, posted videos showing Bill Hader transforming very subtly into Tom Cruise as he performs an impression of the latter on Dave Letterman's show. It picked up 4 million views in a week. It's important to note that the ability, this ability is available to amateurs. Pause. And in fact, it is. Uh, although the, the, the open source uh, access to this technology is still kind of uh, shoddy, there are definitely companies online that will do this sort of thing for you. Uh, and uh, Occultus Veritatis, if they haven't released their episode on this, uh, keep an eye out for when it does come. And if they have released it, I'm going to link to it at, at the end of this show because they, in Occultus Veritatis, the, the uh, I guess podcast I mentioned once or twice, they have gone through and done this as, as kind of like an amateur level for free or for at least super cheap. They were able to create some uh, really interesting videos. The one person from there or showed me a couple of them and they were really realistic. Like, I mean, good enough to fool someone on a webcam, 100% for sure, and good enough to fool someone who wasn't paying attention probably 95% like, there, there were still little glitches and uh, little artifacts in the video, but nothing that you wouldn't already see on a low-quality digital video anyway. And this was only done with, like, what was it, three pictures? Or, like, a five-second clip of someone in, like, maybe an hour of processing time? The technology for deep fakery is definitely ready for prime time. And as a service, uh, deep fakes is not going away. The algorithms to do it are pretty well publicized. They're easy enough to understand that a, a mid-year computer science student could cook something up. The computing power is definitely available to pull off more than enough. The, the samples of everyone are available. So to some extent, he's got a point here that there is this threat of the media that we consume being fake. Now, that being said, has it ever not been fake? Like. When you go to the New York Times, you're, they kind of purport to be this authoritative version of the truth, but there have been so many examples of where they just have dropped the ball on that. And yes, we, we should be more critical of media generally, but I think that the, the value of the, what he's worried about being fake here, we've kind of already lost that. And sure, deepfakes are going to make some kinds of things uh, easier to pull off. So, for example, his grandfather's team. But anyway, continuing on, let's, let's get to the end of this. Quote, I'm already in the position, as many of you soon will be as well, where anyone can produce a believable audio and perhaps a video of me saying absolutely anything they want to say. How can this possibly be thought? Pause. Well, one example is just to have a cultural shift and to stop assuming that we have the kind of authoritative version a video when we're listening to video. This includes this video, by the way. For all you know, this is an entirely deep faked version of Jeff Cliff. There's really nothing saying that it isn't. So you're going to have to use your brain. And when I say things, think to yourself, hmm, would Jeff actually say that? And if you don't know, then maybe that's that's a sign that this, this media that is in between us is presenting its own picture. That the presentation you see is a concoction of your own situation. Presentation, uh, a construction of the your 
of access to technology in the society you live in. And when we fail to have these authoritative voices that can be relied on, then our world becomes easier to make and easier to manipulate into fandoms and into fictions. And we've been living in this world of fictions and phantoms for quite some time. And yet the world hasn't fallen apart yet, has it? We still have people we want to listen to out there, whether they're real or not. Whether that anonymous voice on the internet is actually a human being is something that for a while now we've had to, to struggle with. And if it says something meaningful to our life uh, and our particular well-being, then maybe it's worth listening to whether or not it's actually a human being. And the kids that are going to grow up in this are going to have to ha deal with this, this crisis of uh, identity and this crisis of how to make sense of a world where most of the participants are fake. Anyway, continuing on, more to the point, how, can we, or how are we going to trust anything electronically mediated in the very near future, say during the next presidential election? Pause. Don't. Everything you hear is fake. Everything. That's how you deal with it. When we start to see the outcome of a presidential debate, what we're going to need to pay attention on is things that can actually be verified. And so if you get a video of Trump saying something, maybe it's time we start being questioning about that. It's like, where did you get that? What's the metadata on that video like? Uh, how can we verify that this is actually true? Before we just start clicking share because, oh, Trump said something stupid, Maybe, maybe, we need something more like a journalist to verify what has been said. But again, what do we do when the journalist has been faked? And the people in our lives have been replaced by these corporate robots and corporate machines and voices, anonymous voices online. Can we be sure that the companies that we have surrounded ourselves with won't do this? Now, Peterson is framing this as a Let's actually let, let's keep going to see how he frames this. Anyway, continue. We are concerned, rightly or wrongly, with fake news. And that's the only news that has been slanted, arguably, by the bias of the reporter, the editor of the news organization. What do we do when fake news is just as real as real news? Pause. Like, for example, when we have sites like Gizmodo that are no more fake or real than The Onion, and The Onion, which is, again, no more fake or real than The New York Times, perhaps. What do we do when we get to that point? Well, uh, one thing we can do is start dealing with human beings again and having journalists that we can verify are actually journalists and not, for example, parts of news organizations that are just giant corporations that are more concerned with advertisement and ads and ad dollars than actually telling the truth. That might be more of it. Continuing on, what do we do when anyone can imitate anyone else for a reason that suits them? And what are the legality of the process? It seems to me that the active and aware lawmakers would take immediate steps make the unauthorized production of AID fakes a felony. A felony! Holy shit. This, this is... I mean, I, I understand why he's freaking out. But what is he calling for, exactly? For example, he's calling for... By saying unauthorized fakes being a felony, that means a computer science student who does a term paper uh, to prove uh, what fakes or to improve the ability of making fakes is A, loses their right to vote in the states, B, faces what, like an indictable offense um, here in Canada, so like five years in jail or more for doing research, for having the output of a program on his own computer produce something that may or may not be shared. And even if it is shared, so what if it is? Your voice, as soon as it leaves your mouth, is, is something that other people can hear and can manipulate. This is, this is not... Uh, something that we should be penalizing people for for concocting things with. Now, granted, I mean, there, there, there's some level of harm that you can definitely do here. And for the people who, who do harm others with it, maybe that it is uh, worth considering having some kind of legal penalty for it. But just merely uh, ham-fistedly making the whole thing a felony is, goes way too far. So, anyway, continuing. And it seems we should, uh, perhaps for a caution to the wind, make this an exceptionally wide-ranging law. We should seriously consider the idea of someone's voice as an integral part of their identity, of their reality, of their person, and that stealing the voice is a genuinely criminal act. Pause. Nobody's stealing your voice, Jordan. The voice is still in your, able to be produced by your vocal cords. This is yet another example of 
copying is not theft. There is no stealing here. It is a act of appropriation, perhaps, of taking, but theft requires that the original be no longer available to you, which it certainly is. If you have a child, that child gains a voice that is pretty much a copy of yours. Not exactly, but it is a copy, an imperfect copy, just like a deep fake version of your voice is not a perfect copy, it is an imperfect copy. So would that mean that having children should be a felony uh, because you're making something with a copy of your voice? That your, your ability to produce sounds, perhaps with a 20 year delay, is something that we should be regulating? Again, I don't think so. So continuing. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to, again, start dealing with human beings in your life. Put down the phone once in a while and talk to human beings. To have institutions of human beings that you can rely on and that use crypto to verify in person who they are. Uh, and when information comes through these media, the, this this form, that we, again, have ways of dealing with the particular media. So like, for example, take, take audio. Audio can be represented in digital form. If you represent audio in digital form, that means that there's a number, uh, a file, a digital file that you can use to then sign cryptographically to verify, oh yeah, this audio is authentic. Of course, the BGP system is having a little bit of growing pains right now with the attacks on their key servers. And that's going to be something in the next near-term future we're going to have to deal with, is how to authenticate given key servers that are censorship resistant are kind of giant red targets for attackers. Now that is that is kind of a, a part of this bigger question of identity and how we can verify who says what online. But again, it's, it's part of a, a bigger cultural level problem. Continuing on, are we entering a future where the only credible sources of information will be direct personal contact? No, crypto gives us the ability to verify things online. We do not have to go entirely to only dealing with each other in person, but there is a value to having people in your life that you can then ver verify using a web of trust that PGP shows is possible, is doable to information that affects us. So that if we have a website that is that looks fake, that we should be able to deal with a human being that, again, we can we can contact, we can then verify uh, using cryptographic means that what was said was said by a human being. And if we can, again, verify that this is not the case, then there might be a cause for action. So continuing, what are, what's going to do, what's that going to do for mass media of all type? Well, hopefully it'll kill it. Uh, mass media has never really been a good thing. This individualized media, this media of a thousand channels or a million or a billion Twitch channels, that is massively better than what we had 20, 30 years ago. We have the ability to have access to information on a scale that, again, uh, the internet has, has, has opened things up. And to the extent that the internet still works, yes, there are places like Australia uh, where certain things are restricted. And yes, there are places like Iran and Saudi Arabia and China and the United States where things are restricted, but things, the internet is still working. We can still get our voices out to some extent. So, continuing on. Why should we not assume that the noise to signal ratio will creep so high that all political and, or political and economic information disseminated broadly will be rendered completely untrustworthy? Maybe the answer is that it has been for quite some time. And we are already at the point here in Canada, with StatsCan being basically a, a giant garbage heap, we've got the news sources that uh, have been, since the days of the media monopoly, so biased that we're hurting for real news. And in places like Thunder Bay, where it's basically a news desert, we're, we're hurting for real news. The problem isn't the, the mediating technology. The problem is we have not invested as a culture, as a society, both on the, the small scale and on the large, in solutions that actually keep people informed, that our culture itself is failing, that there is a level of being informed that people just aren't interested in being. And, or at least if they are, they're not interested in sharing that information widely and making it a democratized source of information. We have things like the CBC, which again, are have been more interested in keeping the truth away from people than actually uh, presenting it honestly for quite some time. And so, yes, there, there is, uh, I guess this goes on, continuing on, quote, I can tell you from personal experience for what it's worth, 
but it's far from com comforting to discover an entire website it's devoted to allowing whoever is inspired to do so to produce audio clips imitating my voice delivering whatever content the user chooses for serious comic or male malevolent purposes. I can't imagine what the world will be like when we will be truly unable to distinguish the real from the unreal or exercise any control whatsoever on what videos reveal about behaviors we never engage in or audio avatars broadcasting any opinion at all about anything at all. This is kind of like, I think, this is a culture shock thing that he's going through, maybe a future shock thing that he's going through. But I don't think it has to be necessarily a bad thing. So for example, 20 years ago, when I was a teenager, if you, you were a young, let's say, good-looking woman, and someone got naked pictures of you, and then somehow managed to post them all over the town, that was a scandal. That was a huge deal. When, young girls killed themselves routinely, like clockwork over it. And it was something that was just showed to be kind of a weak spot in our culture. We were so hung up about who got to see who naked that it was just a, a huge moral uh, failing that we, we lost so many lives, of, and especially good-looking women, like, really. This was the target, the primary target of it. And so gradually, as time has gone uh, forward, uh, so many people have lost their, their pictures of themselves online that it's not as much of a social uh, problem when this happens. I mean, it's still going to be embarrassing. And I'm sure it's still women are going to kill themselves over this, and men too. But generally, the stigma is lower that there's so much out there that it's like, yeah, well, you know, yes, you got access to it. Maybe you shouldn't. There's pictures of a lot of people online. And if you look, you can find a lot of it. But it, is it really that big of a deal anymore? I mean, to some extent it is. But I think as time goes on, we're going to lose that, that kind of uh, sense of having taking as much issue with it. Like, obviously, it may continue for quite some time. But the same thing, I, I think, is going to happen with this. Well, right now, especially the older people like Jordan Peterson are going to look at this and go, oh my god, this is going to cause the downfall of civilization. Just like pictures of naked pictures of us being publicly available online is going to cause the downfall of civilization. Well, it didn't, and people kind of got used to it. And then people got to the point where it's like, yeah, well, it's a big deal. So somebody's making pictures of you online. That's kind of cool. That means you're notable, right? So I think that that's the direction this is going to go. And yeah, there, it is going to be possible to fake anyone online using this technology. The, the tech is there. And again, so does that mean if you see something online that you should believe it? No, of course not. We, we know deepfakes are, are, exist. So maybe a, a little bit more degree of skepticism is kind of warranted there. Quote, wake up. The sanctity of your voice and your image is at serious risk. Uh, the, the sanctity. See, th this is a religious thing, right? He, he has this religious belief that the identity of you is somehow created in, in this God's image or whatever. And he's, he's, he's concerned about the, the sanctity, the, the God-given uniqueness of every individual, even though we are all uh, copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. Continuing on, uh, it's hard to imagine a more serious challenge to the sense of shared reliable reality that keeps us linked together in relative peace. It's a shared reality. Do we really have that? Did we really ever have that? Shared reality. I, hard to imagine. Anyway, continuing on. The deepfake artists need to be stopped using whatever legal means are necessary as soon as possible. Well, at least he says whatever legal means is necessary. That, that's, that limits things a little bit. But uh, Again, th this technology, technology yes, it's, it's out there and it's going to do things that people are going to be uncomfortable with. But the, the problems are in the institutions themselves and their lack of responsiveness to the people that they serve. If you can't get access to a human being, then, and, and I don't, again, I don't mean over a Skype call. I mean, as a human being finding and getting access to another human being, then maybe the institution that is keeping you from doing this, that, that, that is a problem with it. And if you're using something like Skype that doesn't have some kind of cryptographic verification of who you're talking to, maybe that's starting to be a problem. And again, crypto is, is going to be part of the answer to this. It's not the whole answer. A lot of the answer is going to be in the institutions and culture in our lives and how we deal with other human beings and how we think of other human beings given we only learn about them through media. So, let's see what else was going on. Oh, right. Okay. And then another thing I want to do uh, is someone made a point uh, this past couple of weeks that they don't believe in coincidences. And I think that this is actually kind of like an easy thing to, to demonstrate. So I'm going to actually demonstrate a coincidence as we go. But I think the best way to, dis to, to 
cure yourself of this kind of mistake is actually to play some uh, board games in Dungeons and Dragons. Because when you do so, you are, as part of the game, as part of the game mechanics, you're dealing with a, a lot of chance, and specifically dice. We've got a 1d12 here, 12-sided uh, dice. Unfortunately, I can't find my 1d4 or my 1d6, so I'll have to do for today. But it's just a normal dice. And when we roll it, there we go, we got a 3. So this dice, when rolled, each of these sides comes up at a fair chance. So there are 12 sides, and when we roll it, we have an equal chance of any of these sides coming up. And that means that if we do one. So didn't we just start with three, and then we go to two, and then we go to one? So isn't that interesting that there's this pattern there, that when we roll things over and over again, we start to see that there are these patterns. And the patterns are, are not in the dice. The patterns are not in, in the floor. They're not in the, the air. They're just a consequence. Nine, ten. 11. Oh, isn't that interesting? So we have two sets of uh, counting over three, over six rolls. That's kind of a neat coincidence, right? That we see this pattern when presented with numbers that are generated using a fair and random process that when we look at it from an outsider's perspective, we, we start to ascribe meaning to them. And if we only get a couple of rolls, uh, oftentimes it'll just seem random. Obviously, it's always random. But the, 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 we can't see a pattern because the, the numbers are, there doesn't appear to be a connection. And then other times that we will see a pattern. There are a lot of patterns to be found in random, random data. So for example, we just saw two of them, actually probably three. So three, two, one, uh, nine, ten, eleven. Those, those are patterns that you think you're if you're just looking for a sea of randomly generated digits, your eyes might just sort of latch onto that. That when we're perceiving random data and we're perceiving randomness, we look at those patterns and we go, oh, I know what that is. That's a pattern. And that is what a co uh, coincidence is. It is when things happen in your life and you look to see that there is a pattern there, it is a, a coincidence of those, the the items that are, that are happening in your life. And sometimes the patterns represent something that's actually causing the, the numbers to come up or the choices to be made or the things in your life to turn out the way that they are. And it is worth investigating to see, is it something that, this thing that happened, is it due to pure chance? Or is it because there's a factor causing or helping that chance to happen? And so when we live our life, Random events happen all the time to us. We, as we're driving down the, or biking down the street, we get stoplights. Stoplights are more or less a random thing. If you start at one point in the city and you go to another part of the city, uh, especially the first stoplight you go to is going to be red or green depending on some, basically things that are not in your control. I mean, to some extent, they're going to be correlated to the time of day. There's a lot of things they could be correlated with. But if you're just randomly going from one part of the city to the other uh, at a random time, you're going to get a random light. And same thing with other things in our life, things that other people say, things how other people vote. There are so many random things that happen or things that can be treated as random or de facto, de facto random. And some of those things may have causes but they're still randomly distributed as far as you're concerned. And so when they come at, and when you get an outcome, six, nine, isn't that interesting? We've got a six and a number that also looks like a six. See, we can see all these patterns. We can detect patterns. We can always, or if we're, if we're really good at learning about seri or ser sequences of numbers and series of numbers, and if we spend a lot of time with numbers, we start to see a lot more complicated types of patterns. Uh, when I go to work, again, I'm, one of the things that I do is I, I mark these kids' works. And one of the kinds of questions they have to deal with is seeing patterns of numbers and seeing which numbers fit and which ones don't. And as the kids get older, they get to see more complicated types of patterns. And same thing if you go in even in more advanced mathematics outside of what you would learn in elementary school or high school, you get even more and even more kinds of situations that, uh, kinds of patterns that you can see and understand and make sense of. And so when you're dealing with random data, it gets more and more tempting to say, oh, hey, that's, that's a coincidence, or hey, that's funny, or oh, hey, that's 
kind of cool, but the, the numbers show up and line up in a, a certain way. The pattern matches a certain way. The, the data matches a certain way. And sometimes there is something to that. Maybe sometimes there is uh, a real reason why the, the outcome of something happens. Uh, there's some reason why you are in the car accident. There's some reason why the person you love gets cancer. Maybe they smoke. Maybe they've been drinking their entire life, and they're, now their, their body has been, their immune system has been weakened, their, their internal organs have been stressed to the point where they can't deal with it anymore. Uh, there, there are things that can contribute to the, the ways, the outcomes that our life results in, but also possible is 10, 2, 6, 10, 7, 2, 4, 6, 4, 6, 1, 12, 1. Let's see if we can get two in a row. 5, 3, 9, 7, 7. There we go. So, also possible is for, given enough rolls of the dice, that we're going to see the pattern we want to see. And so we always have to be careful about that. We have to be skeptical of our own sense of our, our own ability to detect patterns in our life, our own ability to, to see patterns and to experience them. Because sometimes what we see to be a pattern is just an illusion, an illusion of a fair process, the outcome of which can be studied, at least in principle, the accounting of which requires that occasionally things that look like patterns emerge, or things that look like patterns happen. No matter what pattern it is, there's a likelihood that it will happen. No matter how complicated a, a sequence we desire, you roll the, this dice enough time, you're going to get it. No matter how thoughtful your, your, your authenticated media is, a series of monkeys typing on typewriters can generate it. It's up to us to look at the things we experience and to put it in context, verify what we've experienced, meshes up to everything else we've experienced to do the work to understand the world we live in. And going back to the, the deep fakes thing, we have for a long time had the ability to have these this media in our life that is basically a copy, an unauthorized copy of some something. We've got the Yes Man producing documentaries and press releases of big companies. We've had all kinds of things like it. Uh, social engineering, we've had uh, everything up, up to and including perhaps a government put into place by fortune. But we still want to be making sense of our world. Not not just giving not giving up on looking for patterns, not not that sort of thing. But at least when we have this this perception of things, that we always keep a skeptical eye. And we train ourselves to detect not just the patterns in our lives, but how robust those patterns are, how valid the information and opinions in our life are. Anyway, with that in mind, I'm going to play one last clip here. Uh, this is a, a little bit of an older clip. This is from John Gilmore. I think John Gilmore is actually dead now. Let's bring this again. And uh, so this is an interview of him talking about one of his political uh, projects where he basically tries to do the right thing on travel. And so he, he fully admits that someone has to stand up to the U.S. government when it decides to take rights away from people, to at least make sure that they do so according to the rule of law. And that someone, in this case, had to be him. So worth listening to what he has had to say, because it, I think it makes what happened later make a lot more sense. We're going to talk a little bit more about secret laws as we go forward into the next episode or two. But this is, again, another example of where they kind of started. So let's give it a listen. And as usual, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to donate on Subscriber Star, uh, Villages, or Bitcoin. And if you have any Creative Commons music or rants, uh, send them to me. I'll give them a listen and probably play them on my next show. So with that, let's uh, fade out with uh, John Gilmore from the EFF. The key here is what's, what's happening at the Supreme Court. Court. It's uh, about secret law. And the question is whether the federal government can force us to follow laws that they refuse to publish. In particular, the requirement that people show ID to get on airplanes. 
So there's a lot of factual and legal history on how the case got to here. It involves me trying to fly on a plane on July 4th in 2002 and them bouncing me because they didn't have an ID. But, you know, so we sued about that issue as well as about secret law. We lost on some issues in the district court. We lost on all those issues in the Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit. And we decided just to bring the secret law issue to the Supreme Court because it's the issue that resonated with most of the people we talked to. When you ask people, should you be able to get on an airplane without ID, some people say yeah, some people say no. You know, there's differences of opinion, but when you ask people, should you be able to read the laws you're required to follow so that you actually know the details so that they can't be changing the details on you and telling you the law is one thing while they're enforcing a different one. Uh, most people agree on that and we thought that a clear majority of the Supreme Court was more likely to agree on that as well. So that's the issue that we raised. So had you been uh, traveling, I mean, had you been able to fly without an ID before? Oh yeah, before 9-11 I'd flown many times without ID. The, the policy was actually put in after TWA 800 blew up in the 1990s. You know, that they suspected terrorism, there never was any. It turned out to be a spark in the gas tank. But um, President Clinton wanted to announce new airline rules when he was uh, making a speech about this. So a couple of guys sat up all night and dreamed up new rules. And one of the new rules was, oh, you got to show ID. But this wasn't done through any kind of law. It wasn't done through any kind of standard rulemaking. It was just done as orders to the airlines. You guys at the front desk start checking people's IDs. And, and the, the key part of that was that they couldn't order the citizens to show an ID. They could just order the airlines to ask for it. So once you discovered that, you know, they would ask you for an ID and you would say, no, thank you. You know, and then they would let you on the plane. Uh, but after 9-11, they changed that so that they wouldn't let you on the plane, or at least some of the time they wouldn't let you on the plane. Um, but we could never actually find out what the new rules were. And these were the same new rules uh, as that Clinton put in, or they were reinforced after 9-11? Well, again, because all of these are secret, we don't actually know. So essentially, how? Uh, I mean, I would ask how. You know, how could there be a law if it's secret? If it's not written, if if nobody can read it, then how is it actually a law? That's a great question. Um, if you put guards with guns in a bunch of locations and they tell you, you know, do this or we don't let you through, is that a rule? Is that a law? Does that have a direct effect on the public and on their ability to go about their lives? That, that meets the definition of a, of a law to me, but somehow they forgot to go through Congress to, uh, to make it into one. So uh, when you first began uh, taking the case to court, um, what, were you, what were you arguing? You were just arguing on the secret law, uh, trying to figure out why it was. We were, we were arguing partly that, that they couldn't enforce a law without publishing it to us, that because it restricts fundamental rights, it has to be, it can't be a vague law. And the right to move around in your own country, the right of assembly is clearly a fundamental right. The, uh, we, also, we also argued that because you have a right to travel, a right to move around in your own country, they had to meet a whole set of tests in order to pass a law that would restrict that right, sort of the same way that they can't arbitrarily pass a law that says you're not allowed to publish it. There has to be a clear, compelling government interest that that's a reason for this law. The law has to be limited so that it can't doesn't reach any further than it needs to reach to satisfy that interest, has to be administered fairly, 
you know, give due process in the administration, all sorts of things like that. They hadn't done any of this about IDs in airports. And it turns out we, we did a survey of people who had tried to go through airports with no IDs. And we discovered that about 80% of them get on the airplane. Really? That if you go in and say, damn, I lost my wallet in the cab and, you know, it'll take me half a day to find it and get it back and my plane's leaving in 30 minutes, you know, they generally let you on the plane. Uh, over and over and over. I have a friend who wasn't even searched in that process. And when she said, oh, you know, my wallet's back home, you know, I can go back there. He said, oh, no, no, we'll, we'll let you fly to L.A., you know, no problem. And she said, but it's only a day trip, you know, I won't be able to fly back at the end of the day. She said, oh, no, let me make a note in your record and then I'll let you on. Just based on, you know, she's a pretty girl in her early 20s getting on a plane. <laughs> so, what did, uh, what did the courts uh, decide the first time? Well, the first time around uh, in the district court, the whole thing was a bit confused because the government refused to admit uh, the existence of the rule or, or reveal it to the court. So the court decided partly that it, it it couldn't make a decision about a rule it couldn't see. But another piece of what happened is TSA has gradually been dropping little phrases and sentences into the law over the years as they, as they send suggested bills into Congress. And one of these had said, oh, if you want to challenge a security-related order of the TSA, you can't do that in the usual kind of courts you have to file an original case in the Court of Appeals, not an original case in the, in the district court. And so the district court judge looked at this and said, well, TSA claims you're challenging a secret order of theirs, and if you're challenging an order of theirs, you have to go to the Court of Appeals. So I'm the wrong court, I can't answer you. <laughs> Made it easy for him. For her, yeah. For her, sorry, so, so you went to appeals. So, well, so rather than drop that first case and file an original case in the appeals court, we thought, no, this is the wrong answer. You, you ought to be able to file such a case in the district court because otherwise what you've got is a kangaroo court. The, the rules for this sort of appeal say you're not allowed to bring any evidence in. The only evidence the court can consider is the record created by the agency. And you, the person who was bounced off the plane or whatever, can't even submit evidence about what happened to you on the day they bounced you. And it was totally jury rigged to just be impossible. And so we went into the, we, so we appealed the lower court's decision saying, no, you, this kind of case has to go to a district court, which whose job is fact finding. It's, you know, it's to hold hearings and have a jury and weigh evidence and do all of that stuff. Um, well, the government argued in the Court of Appeals that the court had been right all along, that this needed to be in the Court of Appeals, and that, but that rather than just turning down our appeal, what the court should do is convert our appeal of the district court case into an original case in the Court of Appeals and then immediately throw it out. And ultimately that's what the court did. We never, from, from the day we filed this in 2002, we have never been able to amend the complaint to, to deal with any of the changing factual circumstances in, in what's been going on in air security since 2002. We, we, you know, at each stage they denied us the ability to amend the case and kicked it on to a further stage where they could throw it out. So, which brings us to, uh, to right now, where... Right. So, right now, the Supreme Court hasn't taken this case yet. We're asking them to do so. We're at the cert, cert stage. And we believe that... When you, uh, when you submit the uh, request for cert? 
Oh, we submitted this uh, several months ago. You can read uh, most of the paperwork in this case, including all the Supreme Court paperwork at paperspleaseorg slash Gilmore, G-I-L-M-O-R-E. And we submitted this several months ago, and the court has been waiting for the government's response papers, which they've taken two extensions on, and those will be filed today. Well, it, it will be, actually what we're doing tomorrow is talking about the case with the press and having our amici come out, having other organizations that have an interest in the case come out and talk about why they think it's important that the Supreme Court take a look at secret law and decide. Like what organizations? Well, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And, and various other orgs that have signed on to their brief, and the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. And paperspleased.org? Uh, yes, that's where you'll find copies of all of this. Okay, so you're gonna, so what you're gonna explain is that actually you're trying to uh, get to the bottom of what are these secret laws? Why can you have secret laws? What what kind of secret laws are you looking at? I mean, are there any other examples besides specifically whatever it, it, it is said that um, they want to on a plane? Well, it turns out that in a lot of places where we look at ID requirements that have come up since 9-11, these have been done without any kind of uh, congressional action and without any formal publication of rules. So, for example, you now have the same sort of armed guards at the doors of federal buildings checking everybody the way they always used to check you through a magnetometer. At some point they just decided by fiat that you can't come in unless you show a, an ID into a federal building. Same sort of thing where um, nothing published, no rules, no, no laws, but if you show up there, you know, they march you out if you don't have an ID. And there have been, have there been instances where people have been arrested for, for refusing to do so? Um, we're working on a case where someone was certainly seized and, and marched out of the building. They weren't arrested, but they, in fact, they lost their case in the court because they showed up for a hearing and were not permitted to attend it. That case is also described at papersplease.org. And then, so, is uh, your case, is that like an umbrella case for a lot of these, or? No, my case was just filed earlier than most of these, so it's the one that's gotten the furthest through the court system. Okay, I see. Have you, are you aware of any other um, people who have tried to take uh, the litigation this far? Any other cases in which they've tried to? There are lots of cases where people are litig litigating about secrecy of various things that the administration has been doing. Uh, many of them are freedom of information cases. Some of them are cases about things like Guantanamo or enemy combatants or habeas corpus or these sorts of torture. And, um, so there's a fair amount of secrecy litigation going on, but this is the only case I know of that's uh, at this stage that's dealing specifically with the secrecy of the law. And at the same time, with a uh, situation that really applies to practically everybody. Right, yeah, at least everybody who travels by air, everyone who travels on Amtrak, and uh, according to what we've been told uh, on uh, many inner city bus lines on the East Coast. And so you travel without any identification? I'm, I'm living without identification sort of as a canary in a coal mine trying to figure out what rights we still have and what rights have been abridged. And the result is I can't drive, I can't take airplanes, I can't take trains. Uh, I live in San Francisco so I take public transit and I bicycle and I ride in the cars of 
other people. And I can take Greyhound to some places. And that's how I get around. What can I read? Why me? Well, the reason I'm doing this is because I couldn't get anyone else to. I mean, I work on civil rights in, in other realms. I work on drug policy. I work on civil rights in, on the internet. And, but I couldn't find anybody else who would give up their ability and practice to move around their own country to make this challenge happen. Um, but a fundamental right was getting taken away, was being made conditional, was being, was being blacklisted to where if the government just throws your name on a list, in a totally secret, unaccountable list, they can say, oh, that person is not permitted to move around in his own country. He can't see his family, he can't relocate uh, his job. Um, he has no way to challenge it. It's all done on secret evidence without any court proceedings. It's just, oh, that right's been withdrawn. Sorry. And nobody was doing anything about this. And I thought, well, I, I can't do anything about 9-11. I can't do anything about Iraq. I can't do anything about the Patriot Act. But I can do something about this. And so I am. I think a lot of us will appreciate that effort. Um, and so do you do a lot of this on your own? I mean, I know you No, I'm not a lawyer, so I've hired lawyers to do the, the legal work on this, but this isn't an EFF case. I mean, EFF, um, EFF cares about issues of identity and privacy and things like that, but issues about freedom of movement and uh, traveling in your own country, the secrecy of the laws is not what they're focused on and they have plenty of work to do in the areas they are focused on. So, you know, I was hoping that somebody with a broader uh, look at civil liberties like the ACLU would take on things like this. Indeed, the Center for Constitutional Rights has a project on freedom to travel. They've been focused for many years on the freedom of Americans to travel to Cuba because the government has had a, a blockade and it says oh, you're not allowed to find out what's happening in Cuba, you're not allowed to go there and see what's going on, you're not allowed to sponsor humanitarian projects there. Now, you know, it turns out Cuba is not an international pariah. You know, Cuba's a country. If you go to any other country in the world, you know, they have flights to Cuba, their people go to Cuba, come from Cuba, they go there for vacations. It's like, it's a country. But the United States has a bee in its bonnet about this, and the Center for Constitutional Rights has been trying to overturn that. But they're the only other folks I know doing major work on right to travel issues. I guess the ACLU must be too busy with other stuff. They haven't really taken much interest. Yeah, um, one of the things uh, someone from the ACLU told me a long time ago is that a lot of their job is sort of like the guys in the old westerns who are putting hats up on poles to make it look like there's a lot of people defending, but that actually, you know, they can't take on even a small fraction of all the cases right. where people's rights have been violated, and this was one that they just chose not to take. You know, it's a, it's a new thing over the last five years or a decade that there's this secrecy element that a, a lot of our society has grown to just be accustomed to or uh, not necessarily stand up and fight. It's very so, yeah. Well, the, actually, government attempts to keep things secret probably since the country was founded. It's just that in the lemming-like uh, state of Congress and the public after 9-11, the administration has been able to get away with murder on secrecy. 
and of course the result is what you see almost every time you have rampant uh, uncontrolled secrecy in a, in a powerful entity is you know mistakes are made and they're covered up with secrecy uh, incompetent people uh, get away with things uh, malicious people get away with things malevolent people get away with things uh, you know terrible things happen under the cover of secrecy and the reason we have a history of open government the reason we have a freedom of information act and the right to speak up and petition our government, the right to understand what the government's doing, to see its budgets and to understand where our tax money is going, all of that stuff is because without accountability for what they're doing, governments tend to become despotic. They become our masters instead of our servants. And in a, in a climate of fear, that's been fostered by the Bush administration, all too many people were willing to say, oh, we'll just trust them to do whatever's best for us. That's always a recipe for getting yourself screwed. And that's the process we are now going through, realizing just how screwed we are by things. I'm sure there are many other things along the lines of Abu Ghraib or the war in Iraq or the war on civil liberties that we just haven't found out the Bush administration has done to us yet. We may never find out. Most of these things come out over time. I mean, uh, the Eisenhower administration had hatched a plan to stage a fake attack on the United States and claim it had come from Cuba as an excuse to invade Cuba. Um, this, uh, this was very hush-hush. It was all done in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and most of the paperwork for it was burned after it didn't happen, but it ended up one general had a copy of this in the notes in his safe at home or something, and after he died, one of his literary executors found him, and they ended up being published in uh, one of James Bamford's books, I think, Body of Secrets. So. Yeah, if it's something that shocks the conscience, that goes directly against the principles the country was founded on, or the trust that people have placed in the government, yeah, you know, anytime an honest person comes across it, they're going to shout it to the rooftops and it'll get discovered. So we have seen a cycle of, of this kind of thing, and also with, you know, Nixon and then with Vietnam and whatnot, I mean, be a time where uh, a culture of secrecy just won't make it, you know, based on even though the secrets might be found out someday, by then it'll be too late. Well, yeah, I mean, I think actually that's been the, the strategy on one level of the Bush administration from the beginning is to have already done everything they wanted to do and been out of office before they got caught at any of it. But, uh, I think it's a thing that goes in cycles, that when people, when the public has had a bad experience with secrecy, like they had during Vietnam and during Watergate, then there's a, a public backlash and, a, and eventually a congressional backlash, and that's what actually led to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the, but then a whole generation uh, grows up without knowing, without living through the earlier times and taking it for granted that they can find out what's going on in the uh, government. And they don't care so much about the topic until, of course, the abuses rise up to the level where they're hurting all of us. And then, then another cycle starts again. And still, yeah, very few Freedom of Information Acts I know are submitted on behalf, you know, on behalf of the Defense Department for information from then, from the major uh, media at least. But, um, um, you know, what do you think it is, though, about our society, our own culture, where, you know, people, you know, who are in power, you know, who are, who are in powerful positions, or, just uh, resorts to secrecy and, you know, 
kind of tricks me you know, that I'm maybe not doing the right thing, but it will allow them to do what they want. And I think this happens in more America as well. Oh, I think it happens throughout life. Yeah. I mean, people cheat on their spouses and try and keep it secret. People cheat on tests and try and keep it secret. Um, you know, people lie and they steal and they do a variety of things that maybe they are not proud of. But it often seems easier to hide it and hope they get away with it. Uh, it's a part of human nature. You can't somehow say, oh, now that these people are in government, they'll stop being human, so we can trust them. Well, thank you very much. Sure, thanks for your interest.